Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, one of the ways in which the killing machine of war just keeps on killing. Our guest, K.J. No, together with Claudia Chopin, whom we tried to have on but had technical difficulties, has published an article in Social Medicine called The Neglected Role of the Military as a Disease Vector, Implications for COVID-19 and for Global Health Policy. Claudia Chauvin is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Global Health, past Program Director of the Graduate Program in Health at York University. K.J. No is an independent scholar, journalist, and educator specializing in the geopolitics of Asia and in issues of global security and health. We'll have a link to their article up at talkworldradio.org. K.J., welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you for coming on. So very interesting article. Uh, it seems there have been outbreaks of COVID in the U.S. military and subsequently in populations living near U.S. military bases. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's a well-known historical fact that the military has been a significant incubator of uh, diseases simply because of the n nature in which uh, you know uh, soldiers train and live and eat uh, together. There's no such thing as social distancing in the military, but also uh, because of the way in which the U.S. military, which has bases in uh, 800 bases around the world and does 170 operations, uh, does operations in 170 countries. Uh, and it does these maneuvers uh, in a kind of extraterritorial way. That is to say, U.S. troops travel between countries, but they're not required to go through passport control, uh, to apply for visas, to, uh, they're not obliged to follow local health regulation. They are essentially, uh, they go in and out and do whatever they want. And so this creates a massive uh, gap in a global a public health regime, and we noticed that there are many, many places, many, many countries, many, many regions that had effectively shut down uh, uh, COVID transmission, but then had sudden outbreaks, large outbreaks of COVID, uh, and it can easily be correlated to the presence of military bases and the uh, transportation and the movement of U.S. military soldiers. What are uh, a couple of examples of places where this has happened? Well, you can see this in Hawaii, which has a large base presence. You can see this in Guam. Uh, you can see this in Bavaria. You can see this in uh, Seoul, uh, Korea, which uh, almost uh, you know, eradicated uh, COVID for a while there. Probably the clearest example is Okinawa, which last year in March had a small outbreak, about 150 cases. And then they implemented very strong public health measures and they uh, eradicated uh, the transmission of COVID completely. However, after a four month period of absolutely no transmission, uh, there was a sudden large outbreak. And this was traced to uh, US military troops in Okinawa. Okinawa has a very large U.S. military presence, and it was uh, shown that there were super spreader events uh, caused by the U.S. military uh, because uh, the military was celebrating the 4th of July. And as a result of that, at the current moment, one out of 48 people in Okinawa has uh, COVID, and it's a, you know, a tremendous, uh, you know, public health issue right now. But all of this is to say that uh, the fact is that the U.S. was able to break through Okinawa's sanitary cordon, this uh, public health cordon, because it had this extraterritoriality of being able to send troops in and out at will. And when the Okinawan government asked for the names uh, and the places where U.S. military had traveled uh, had been present or the individuals, uh, 
uh, as a matter of doing, you know, normal contact tracing, the U.S. military refused. It's a, a situation in Okinawa where I, I want to ask, are people getting upset and protesting, but it's hard to imagine them doing so more than they are already when you have uh, three quarters of the people opposing new bases, the politicians elected to stop the bases, the governor demanding that a new base not be built, and the U.S. and Japanese governments uh, together just overriding uh, all of that public interest uh, and election elected representation in Okinawa, uh, but I'll ask it anyway, have, have governments in Okinawa or anywhere else on the world registered, dared to register any sort of complaints uh, about this problem? You know, it's a really interesting question you pose there, because I would say for the most part, this has been third rail stuff. Most governments won't touch it. Uh, even the journals uh, won't touch it. We're talking about you know, scientific medical journals. This is a, you know, deeply researched um, paper, uh, but most medical journals would not publish it. Uh, we wrote a rebuttal to an earlier Lancet article, uh, which, uh, and, and the Lancet would not even publish our letter. So this is definitely third rail stuff. But in the case of Okinawa itself, it's very interesting. You know, the Japanese government never criticizes the U.S. government, because it's essentially an appendage of the U.S. government. It was put into place by the U.S. government. Uh, but in this case, both the uh, governor of Okinawa uh, and the Japanese mainstream press essentially took the U.S. to task and took the U.S. to task for its uh, status of forces agreement. These are the political agreements that give U.S. troops immunity and extraterritoriality and impunity uh, when they commit, uh, when, which allows them to do whatever they want to do. And the Japanese government, uh, the Okinawan government, came out strongly denouncing and put its, putting its finger directly uh, on naming the status of forces agreement. But not the Japanese government, far away from uh, Okinawa. <laughs> It's been it's been a kind of an indirect, but clearly the Japanese government themselves are very upset about this too. You you mentioned you mentioned, KJ, no, you KJ mentioned no, this, uh, this uh, Lancet, Lancet article, article that you refer to in your paper uh, uh, that describes uh, COVID, uh, COVID uh, outbreaks, outbreaks in, in Africa, Africa and looks and at causes, causes, but, but apparently, apparently makes, makes no mention no of the of the, the U.S. military, military, right? Yes. So, um, you know, there was an article in Lancet um, early uh, last year, uh, which was uh, claimed to assess the risk of COVID transmission into Africa, essentially that, you know, Africa is at risk, clearly, because it doesn't have a lot of the public health infrastructure, but also that, you know, there was travel from, uh, that there were disease vectors that were being imported into Africa. And it was only mentioning uh, Chinese uh, travel uh, and into civilian airports. And my, um, my uh, colleague, Dr. Chauvin, uh, and I, we said, wait, that doesn't make any sense. You know, Africa does not do significant uh, air travel with uh, China, for example, but there are massive movements of U.S. troops into Africa. There are air bases. There are bases, there are lily pads. There is a significant U.S. presence in Africa, especially in the Sahel. And so we said to ourselves, why isn't the, this being noticed and tracked? Uh, and, of course, the Lancet refused to you know, point out what we thought was a very reasonable um, you know, um, a fact. And so then we just went deeper and, and uh, you know, researched and published this article in another journal, but much later. We're speaking with K.J. No, co-author of an article. We'll have a link to it at talkworldradio.org. Uh, you also, K.J., mention Ireland uh, in your article. What, uh, what's the situation there with the U.S. military? Well, uh, Ireland, once again, you know, has a significant U.S., uh, uh, you know, transit and presence. Uh, and, you know, this has been a bone of contention for uh, the Irish, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, rightly so. I mean, they have objected to, you know, the transfer of prisoners for rendition, among other things. But uh, U.S. troops were found to have had COVID. Uh, you know, the government requested information and measures. And of course, once again, the response was stonewalling. And so, again, the problem seems to be the U.S. military being above the rule of local law in all of these dozens of places around the world. Uh, and on top of that, there's a problem of, of secrecy, right? They're, they're above any requirement to tell anybody what they're doing. Um, is, how much is that a factor here? Yes. And so there are two issues there. One is... Uh, when the U.S. Uh, has a base in uh, a host country, it uh, negotiates what are called status of forces agreements. And this essentially gives the U.S. forces immunity, impunity, and uh, extraterritoriality. They're like diplomats. They can't be held for most crimes. They're not subject to most laws. And certainly, uh, they can be exempt from public health measures. Uh, except as they would choose to uh, engage with them on a voluntary basis. But the other aspect of this, and this goes to uh, a much more serious uh, flaw in um, U.S. Uh, policy, is that in 2005, the United States carved out an exemption for its own military in the U.N. International Health Regulations. Now, the United Nations IHR, International Health Regulations, require, of course, reasonably, that every country should report major outbreaks of disease that might be of international concern. The U.S. has carved out this exemption because they claim that having to report troops who are sick would undermine the ability of the U.S. Armed Forces to operate effectively in pursuit of their national security interests. In other words, if you have to report that troops are sick and where they are sick and how many are sick, you're essentially disclosing troop movement. And the U.S. wants to have a kind of carte blanche to keep all of this under the radar, to keep it secret. And this lack of transparency is clearly uh, you know, a serious problem. There, there seems to be a pattern of legal exemptions, uh, of permitted secrecy, but also of just voluntary omission and not wanting to talk about these things. So, so you have all of these climate agreements that exclude the military, give waivers to militaries, go ahead and destroy the climate. You have endless news coverage of budgetary issues in the U.S. government where half the money is going to the military, but there's no mention of it, doesn't exist. Green New Deals and other legislation drafted as if there's no military, no mention of it. Uh, most U.S. Congress members run for Congress with campaign websites that never mention the existence of the world or the military or the budget or war or peace. just doesn't exist. It, it seems there's a desire in our culture and in our uh, the structures of our society to just pretend that the militarism isn't there. We, we don't want to think about it too closely. Is, I mean, it's, it seems to be part of a pattern more than an exception that the military as a disease vector would be left out of consideration. Uh, does it seem that way to you? Yes, this, this is absolutely correct. I mean, to remove uh, the military as a disease vector is an incredibly foolish uh, action from a public health measure because the military, uh, you know, as we point out in our article, has been a huge vector of disease. The greatest uh, uh, epidemic in modern history was caused by the U.S. military. I'm talking about the Spanish flu, which was transported by U.S. troops in Kansas to Europe uh, during World War I, where it killed more people than the war itself. We estimate somewhere between 50 to 100 million people perished from the Spanish flu and about uh, half a billion people were infected. But the core issue, as you point out, is this uh, uh, exemption, which, you know, I think we can point to uh, 
is really a manifestation of U.S. exceptionalism, the U.S. exceptionalism that manifests as a kind of exemptionism, uh, you know, the, the total lack of transparency. You know, when we went into Iraq, the military said that we don't do body counts. Uh, we went into Afghanistan, no body counts. What we do know is they were doing what they call snitch counts, which is to count the number of people who would turn in their fellow uh, citizens uh, as if that were some useful metric of the gains that, you, that the U.S. was making. But that's a terrible way to run any policy to you know, count the number of citizens that betray each other. But anyway, the fact is the U.S., always seems to carve out exemptions for itself, certainly uh, regarding greenhouse gas emissions. We know that the U.S. military as a single greenhouse gas uh, emitter is larger than many countries. For example, if it were a country, it would be somewhere in the uh, 40th, uh, you know, uh, uh, it would be about 40th or 50th in, in its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the same thing with, you know, its lack of transparency in many, many areas and its exception that it carves out, for example, International Criminal Court Commission against the, you know, uh, discrimination against women, etc. It's a long-standing issue and it really has to do with exceptionalism that manifests as exemptions. I, I imagine you're aware, KJ, though many listeners may not be, why this uh, Spanish flu was mislabeled the Spanish flu. Uh, do, you, do you recall how it got that name? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, essentially, uh, this goes back to what you said, the same kind of lack of transparency and the exceptionalism, the exemption, exemptions. Uh, there was a blackout on the reporting of uh, flu victims. And Spain was the only country that had clear and transparent reporting. And so it was reporting its cases, and therefore it looked as if, you know, Spain was the epicenter of this uh, flu, when, of course, it was not. This has a, a rough uh, analogy with, uh, for example, the current situation with COVID, where China is being tarred with having caused the, um, you know, COVID outbreak, when actually... Uh, there's very, very strong evidence right now that shows that, for example, there, were, there, was, a, there was a case in the United States where a person did, was, died from COVID uh, in, uh, in, the week, in the second week of January, which would make it about the same time as China. In other words, there's good evidence to show that COVID, the COVID outbreak happened in many, many places around the world. And it seems that China was simply the first country to notice and report it. Uh, in, indeed. Uh, uh, indeed. And, you have, uh, and you have these attacks on China over the China possibility, China possibility, unproven, that it came from a lab or from researchers in, in China, China, with very little mention of the fact that this was a lab with international, including U.S. funding and support and participation, so that it makes a very bad sort of uh, criticism of, of China, even if it should be proven true. Um, and, and very little mention of the, of the terrific job that China did of controlling the uh, once the outbreak happened. Um, but you, you, you talk in your paper, uh, KJ, about numerous disease epidemics in the past spread by militaries and by the U.S. military, not just, not just the so-called Spanish flu, but STDs in Korea, meningococcal disease, swine flu, cholera. Uh, there, there's an established pattern here, right? This wouldn't be something new? Yes, absolutely. Uh, troops, uh, and in particular U.S. troops, have historically been huge vectors and incubators of disease transmission. And as you point out, the Spanish flu, meningococcal disease, uh, uh, STDs, uh, you can correlate the presence uh, of STD outbreaks or the presence of troops. Uh, in South Korea, these actually led to riots at one point in the 70s. Uh, cholera. Mm, cholera, for example, uh, in Haiti has been, you know, traced back to United Nations uh, troops. And, of course, H1N1 itself uh, was found in a U.S. military clinic in San Diego in a U.S. military uh, family. And so this is, you know, there's a clear historical pattern, and there are 
clear reasons for it. You know, the, the living, training, deployment conditions all are conducive to incubation and transmission of disease. And, you know, once again, as we, as, as, as we say in the article, Guam, Okinawa, uh, Hawaii, Japan, Bavaria, South Korea, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, all of these countries either have uh, a large outbreak correlated to the presence of U.S. troops or uh, correlated uh, uh, right after uh, large exercises with U.S. troops. This, this this outbreak, this outbreak KJ, KJ, no, KJ no, of of uh, COVID, uh, COVID around, around the world, world whether or not it had anything, anything at all to do to with do disease, disease researchers, researchers or bioweapons weapons researchers, researchers anywhere on, on Earth, uh, it, it does uh, seem does that, that there is there a is risk, and there are, and there are past are examples, examples uh, of, of these bioweapons bio labs, labs causing these causing outbreaks. I think very clearly with Lyme disease. I don't know if you agree with. Me. Um, and, um, and Nicholson, Nicholson Baker's, Baker's latest book, latest he book points uh, to uh, the, same to the same source for outbreaks of rabbit fever, Q fever, fever, bird flu, stem, stem rust, rust, African swine, swine fever, fever, hog, fever, cholera, cholera uh, uh, etc. Uh, 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 is, is there, is a, there a, a, a danger? Is there an outrageous there risk being, being taken uh, by uh, governments researching these diseases and trying to weaponize them? Um, you know, I don't think there's uh, a risk uh, in terms of research. The research that I understand uh, can be done safely uh, and, um, you know, with all precautions. For example, uh, the Wuhan lab had a BSL-4 laboratory that they spent almost 18 years building, and it was built by the French. They're collaborating with the French, the, the U.S., inspected it and it was actually parts of their research was funded by the US but a BSL-4 lab the Wuhan BSL-4 lab is essentially the equivalent of a bank vault placed uh, inside uh, a submarine uh, inside uh, you know a, a walled uh, you know enclosure it's 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 highly unlikely that there was any leak from there. But we know that the United States has several hundred, uh, you know, biowarfare labs. Uh, it has, it does have a history of using biowarfare. And I think that is adequately shown uh, by the research uh, that has been done about the use of biowarfare in Korea. So, yes, I think biowarfare is very, very dangerous. Uh, and it should not be done, uh, and certainly it should not be done in this non-transparent fashion uh, at uh, Fort Detrick or the hundreds of other U.S.-affiliated uh, labs uh, around the world, uh, you know, in, largely in Eastern Europe. And, and presumably researchers going out in the field and collecting bats and specimens uh, and bringing them, no matter to what kind of a bank vault inside of a submarine, they aren't inside of that bank vault inside of that submarine until they get there, right? Well, you know, David, I'm going to take a little bit of, a, you know, of an exception to what you say there. Sure. Um, I mean, this is the argument of... Um, um, Baker and Wade, you know, and a few others. I want, I want us to think about the fact that first, if, uh, if a disease is out there, if a virus is out there already in nature, then it's highly unlikely that a researcher would have leaked it when on an average millions of people have daily contact with the same bats. I mean, you know, bats are what one quarter of, you know, the uh, mammalian species. So there's an incredible number of them. And we know that millions of people have routine contact with bats. So to think that uh, a researcher having, you know, maybe a half a dozen researchers having very uh, specific and measured contact with bats uh, is the case when you have millions of contacts on a daily basis by regular people, that seems unlikely. You know, it's, for example, the other day uh, I saw, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a deer 
uh, in the East Bay uh, where I live. Now, did that deer escape from one of the zoos in the San Francisco area, or is it just out there all the time? Well, we know they're out there all the time, and I think it's the same thing with uh, these viruses. Uh, very interesting. And, and KJ, no, when, when, when the, the government of China started the lockdown and quarantining, you discuss in your paper the, the response of other countries, of, of U.S. media, for example. What, what was it? Well, you know, so this is very interesting. When China happened, it happened abruptly. They were facing uh, a closed book exam. They didn't know what they were facing, how dangerous it was, what the incubation period was, how lethal it was. But what they did was what they did uh, uh, from previous experience is they locked everything down, which is standard non-pharmaceutical intervention. It's simply good public health. You shut down the system. And once you've shut down the system, you can slow things down enough that you can start to track and trace. Then you can selectively isolate, and then you can start to treat. That was the model. It's being proven over and over again. It's the model that we've used since at least the 16th century. The New York Times and all the pundits came out saying that there was no way that this could work that this was a, simply a, a manifestation of, US author, of Chinese authoritarianism had nothing to do with public health, and therefore they said it would not work and that essentially no country should replicate it. We've, we've seen how flawed that advice was. Absolutely, we have. We, we have just about a minute and a half left. Um, we are always piling on these additional ways in which war kills people and does damage and, and has costs. But the basic idea of war already is killing people. Uh, war directly is one of the top causes of direct death and injury, uh, not to mention indirectly. Uh, if that's not reason enough to end it, is there anything Is there that should anything make, that us, should make think, us think uh, that, showing that showing more ways, more ways in which war kills, war kills such, such as troops spreading pandemics, pandemics via bases, via bases uh, will, make will make a difference? Make a difference. Uh, we'll turn anyone, anyone against, against uh, this, this militarism. Well, the violence of war is so often it's uh, camouflaged, cloaked, and misdirected. And so we can have massive wars in the Middle East, you know, that create millions of casualties. But we our you know, we there's a, a system that allows us to avert our eyes. This is, you know, the propaganda system. But in the case of a pandemic, pandemics travel across borders and they directly affect us. So what is happening in Afghanistan or in Africa or in Okinawa affects us too. And I think this is yet one more reason why we should be paying attention and thinking strongly about uh, enacting measures to uh, curtain military activities and military operations. Uh, very, well very well said and very said, well very done. Well paper, done. it's called paper The Neglected Role neglected of the Military as a Disease, disease vector. vector, Implications for COVID-19 and for Global Health Policy by Claudia Chopin and by our and guest, K.J. No. K.J., no. thank you very, very much very, very for coming much on Talk on World Talk Radio. Thank you so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.